we must move on to questions uh, to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And we will start with the listed questions. And can I uh, inform members that question 15 has ordered? Question 15 has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Uh, question number one, Mr. Speaker. This has been uh, an excellent year in terms of process and payments for single farm payment, and I am pleased to report that the highest ever number of farmers have received their payments promptly this year. My priority right now is to speed up the processing of the tail of inspection cases that occur every year, and I anticipate that the last case will be paid approximately two months faster than last year and four months faster than the year before. There have been recent concerns expressed by members about remote sensing cases, and I can reassure farmers that those cases are now being put through for the final stages before payment. I expect a significant number to be in the farmers' accounts by the end of the month. Call Mr. McKinney for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Shortly, we will be debating the uh, mental well-being of farmers. And, uh, can I ask the Minister to outline, um, is that the total amount of outstanding payments that will be paid to farmers within that period? Yes, and I'm aware of the, of the upcoming debate, and obviously it's a key area, and I'm delighted that it's being discussed in the House, and it shows that um, people have an interest in the welfare of, of farmers and the stresses that they face in their everyday um, jobs. In terms of the applications that have been processed, as I said, we have made significant improvements. We're now four months ahead of ourselves compared to two years ago, so there's um, strides being made, and, and we'll continue to do that in the time ahead. We're sitting now at 93.6% um, of people being paid. And obviously, as I said, we hope to have the remaining number of people paid quite as quickly as possible. And we put particular emphasis on those people that have been um, had their inspections by remote control sensing. Paul Free. Well, Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, 1,139 farm businesses were inspected through remote sensing, of which some of them didn't even realise they had been inspected and would have delays in their single farm payment until the very week they were due to get their money. That has caused great harm with cash flow for these businesses, not only hurting the, the farmers and the business itself, but also the suppliers and the merchants who live in those areas, because you picked two concentrated areas, one in my own constituency of North Antrim and one in Fermanagh South Tyrone. Can you explain to this House why those areas were picked, why the Department has not been able to process those remote sensing inspections, and why have you left those farmers in disarray? Well, I think it's important that people don't lose the run of themselves. And put it in context, put it in context, we're talking about 37, over 37,000 applications that have been received from the department. To the department, we have 35,228 of those have been paid. 93.6% of people have been paid. That being said, and I always said this, that if you're in that remaining 6% of people waiting to be paid, I understand that the stress and the tension that that would cause you. But again, you have to put that in context. Year on year, we have seen improvements. We've had the number of people inspected by remote control sensing. We've really ramped that up from 250 last year to almost 1,200 this year. We've had, um, um, compared to last year, two months increase in payments and, and in, compared to the year before, four months. So there has been year on year um, improvements in the system. This year was always going to be difficult because we were moving towards uh, remote control sensing. Those problems won't be there next year. And I also can give assurances to all those people that those remaining number of people that are um, the 2,409 cases in total that we're talking about. And there's a variety of reasons as to why those people aren't paid. And the member will be very aware probate cases, we're talking over 300 of those. Bank details, there's a whole variety of, of, of issues there. That being said, as I said at the start, if you're in that 6%, I understand your angst. Um, and we're trying to get those people paid as quickly as possible. And we would ha have the majority of those people paid, by the, or certainly by the end of February, very early in March. So there's a lot of work ongoing. There's a lot of positive developments. I think we are changing things for the better. It is taking time, but we are certainly getting there. And in terms of um, people being notified, it actually worked out better for claimants that they weren't notified until December. And the reason being this, the reason being this, it is. It is an inspection, it is a control process that's, that we have to um, include 5% of claims um, have to be inspected. If they were told earlier in the, earlier in the year, there would be no, uh, no ability to make any changes to their claims. So the fact that I didn't have to inform people, but I chose to inform people in December, so they'd be aware to, um, why they hadn't had their payment yet.
Thank you. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. It would be remiss of me not to thank Mr. Frew uh, from the outset for quoting my colleague Robin Swan's press release word for word following the meeting in Glaryford la last week. Um, can I? Can I? A <laughs> screw to do. It's good to know he's reading the Ulster Unionist Party press, but anyway, another year and more problems with DARD and administration of single farm payments, and then competence festers on. Can the minister tell us whether she goes out of her way every year to mishandle administrations of the payments? Because certainly that's how farmers see it. <coughs> I, don't, I don't believe there was a question in that. Um, I think I've um, very clearly set out to the House the steps that were taken to try and improve things, and I do again say that you have to put it in context. We have significantly improved things. 93.6 per cent of people have been paid. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. It has been an excellent year for the payment of single farm payments. Not, Minister, if you are one of my farming constituents in the Port Glenone area, who utterly unexpectedly, as we have heard, uh, have had their, their payments withheld because of the remote sensing. Why could those payments not have been paid in December and recovery in subsequent year if there was anything found wrong, rather than punish them all with this punitive approach uh, across the board. Obviously, we're working under um, European rules, and one of the rules is that you can't make any payment until the whole system, the whole process in terms of inspection, has been completed. And that's the reason why we're not able to make payments. But you have to remember why we're trying to improve things and why we're trying to do more of the inspections or all of the inspections by remote control sensing, so that we are able to get to a position where we are able to make early payments. Um, that's something this House has called for repeatedly over the past number of months. We've had quite a few debates on it. I too want to be in that position to be able to pay people early. So that's why we're um, taking forward the, these measures in terms of the remote control sensing. So, and I think I want to pick up on a point which I think I failed to in, a, in, a, in the earlier question from Mr. Frew around why those areas were chosen. They were chosen at random. And there will always be, I suppose, a difficulty whenever a particular area is chosen. And, but given the fact that it's satellite imagery, it obviously makes sense that you do it in the one geographical area. That being said, and, I, and I'm not going to hide behind the fact that I, if you are not six percent of people that haven't had your, excuse me, your payment, I accept that you will be uh, in feeling anxious about that. You'll be wanting to have your payment. You need your payment to pay your fee and the implications that it has. So we want to be able to get those payments paid out as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I've got the case at all. Question two. <laughs> Rivers Agency has responsibility for 26 <coughs> kilometres kilometers of designated coastal defences around the coastline of the north of Ireland. These defences performed well during the coastal storms at the start of January in that they provided protection to the people and property situated behind them. To ensure that any damage to these defences is identified and repaired, initial post-event inspections of the defences are progressing well, with completion anticipated by early February 2014. More detailed structural inspections are also being progressed in parallel, with completion of these anticipated by the end of March 2014. I am pleased to advise that at this stage there appears to have been no major uh, damage to the defences as a result of the storms. That said, other departments have responsibility for stretches of the coastline, and I would urge them to take whatever action is necessary to repair any damage that has been caused, and consider what further work is required to protect their infrastructure from future coastal storms. Rivers Agency had already identified the likelihood of risk um, of tidal flooding in Belfast and in light of the recent surge tides is reassessing the level to risk to determine what further measures may be needed. Mr Sheehan for a supplementary. Mr Sheehan. I thank the Minister for her answer. And just by coincidence, I was speaking to my colleague Oliver McMullen earlier. Uh, some towns in his constituency, particularly Cushendall and Carnlock, have faced difficulties uh, over the past few months. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether the flood defences are actually fit for purpose, and particularly in terms of the tidal surges that we've witnessed recently. I thank the for the question. And I think there's absolutely no doubt that um, coastal defences were severely tested. And in relation to the fences that um, Rivers Agency are responsible for, th they did perform well. The effectiveness of these designated flood defence assets is constantly reviewed under a rolling inspection and maintenance programme that is operated by Rivers Agency. Whilst Rivers Agency is only responsible for designated sea defences, it has developed mapping of coastal flood risk 
for the whole of the north of Ireland, which is already sharing, um, it's already sharing with key infrastructure owners and the public. The agency is willing to provide whatever additional support is required by other organisations in their assessment of the infrastructure and coastal defences for which they are responsible. Where property for which no other public body is responsible um, has been significantly affected by flooding from the sea, Rivers Agency can examine the options for improving the level of protection, but any works would have to be cost beneficial and also then subject to competing priorities for available funding. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Well, Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for answers to date. Does the Minister recognise that there were areas that were not identified as risk areas by the various agencies, such as Kinniger area of Hollywood, which should have been identified, an area which has been subject to a very heavy swell of Belfast Lock, an area which had been protected mainly with the efforts of local residents, the PSNI, the Council and indeed the Army? with some late support from the Rivers Agency. Is it the case that an area such as the Kinniger area should have been identified early on? I can't speak about that individual area, but I'm happy to give the member more detail in writing if that is in fact an area that is the Rivers Agency is responsible for. As I said, the Rivers Agency is responsible for only 26 kilometres, kilometres of coastal um, line, but there are obviously significant, an awful lot more that is um, looked after by various agencies. So DRD in some instances, councils, um, harbour authorities, there's, there's quite a, a range of, of um, people that are responsible. We're happy to assist any of those agencies where we can, particularly around maps. And one of the um, efforts that, that will happen as a result of all of the incidents from January, if you take the first um, potential warning we had with the tidal flooding, um, there will be analysis just of the work that was done, how everybody responded, and then look to where there's any um, areas or gaps that, that are there. But particularly in terms of the area that we're responsible for, Rivers Agency are responsible for, their defences did perform well. I call Mr Sean Rogers. And thanks to the Minister for your answers thus far. Minister, given that the greater volume of water that a river can hold, the less likelihood of flooding, and given also that the um, corresponding bodies in England are now reviewing the policy of the non-dredging of rivers uh, to help alleviate the flooding problem, have you any plans for a similar review here? I'm very much guided by the technical expertise of Rivers Agency and, as I said, they will be now carrying out, I suppose, a post-event analysis of, of how things performed and they will bring forward recommendations on any measures that need to be taken and I'm quite sure dredging or non-dredging of particular watercourses will be something that's considered throughout all of that. Ian comes to Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I heard what the, min the Minister said, but I'm sure that a number of people who have been listening to the response will not be enamoured by the fact that you said that there were not serious flooding in some areas. Well, I can tell you that in my area there was serious flooding and that people would expect your department to come up uh, to the mark. Will the Minister, uh, in view of that, commit to an audit of all coastal defences to ensure investment is available to secure our homes, farms and businesses uh, when there's future high tides or coastal erosion around the north, north of Ireland? Well, if I could just can, um, correct the member, um, I didn't say that there were areas that didn't um, flood. I said the coastal defences that Rivers Agency are responsible for held up where, where they were uh, needed to. So, uh, as, as I've already said, there will be a post-event analysis of um, all the events that happened and occurred, how everybody responded, and then there will be also be um, recommendations coming forward from Rivers Agency, if needs be, if there are areas where we need to strengthen our, our defences. So I look forward to getting that. And then when they do come forward, then we have to look at um, any of the measures that come forward or any suggestions that come forward and look towards what funding we have available to be able to do some work. I'm going to call Mr. Robin Swan. Question number three, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I consulted with all my executive colleagues on my proposals for the 2014-2020 Rural Development Programme as part of the consultation process. This included asking for views on the funding and prioritisation of my proposals. <coughs> However, I have had no discussion with the Minister of Finance and Personnel in relation to funding for the next programme. The programme is still being developed and at this stage the projected costs will be refined once the review of the consultation responses has been completed. There are a number of decisions that still have to be made on the final shape and the size of the next rural development programme. Once these have been finalised, there will be further substantive engagement with the Department of Finance and Personnel on the um, overall funding requirement. Mr Swan for supplement. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her update. Minister, in the debate we had about the transfer of monies to rural development, I asked would you lay all papers or correspondence you had with the Minister of Finance in the library so that all members could be aware 
of the correspondence. Have you done that yet? Yes, I'm happy to say to the member that um, my official sent a copy of the draft proposals. As I said, um, in, in the debate, I'd said that I sent it to all members, and I would be happy to share it in the library, so I have done that. Um, copies of... I know I'll correct myself. I will do that. I intend to put the, what you've asked for into the library, um, and it'll be in over the next number of days. Sorry, and I call Mr Declan McAleer. Uh, Gerber Augert, uh, could the Minister tell us when will the Growing for Growth strategy be brought to the Executive? Gerber Augert. Well, the member will, will be aware that it's a joint paper for myself and Detty. Um, it was a strategy actually that was developed in partnership with industry, with industry very much in the lead. I have um, recently written to Minister Foster to um, encourage her for, to, for it to go on to the executive. I'm disappointed that hasn't happened to date. However, I'm sure that will happen over the next number of weeks. It's, so, it's now more important than ever that we show industry, I think, that um, we're willing to support the industry, that we have a plan set out, that the executive is committed to um, supporting the industry and moving forward in the asks that have been set out under the Going for Growth um, strategy. I actually met with the, the chair of the Agri-Food Strategy Board over the last number of weeks just to reassure him of my commitment to moving forward with the Agri-Food Strategy Report and bringing that, uh, the executive paper forward so we can um, test executive support for that moving forward. And we, we just need to remember that um, this is a significant body of work that's been done. We don't want to lose any of the momentum. We're talking about 15,000 new jobs to be created. We're talking about 60% increase in sales, 75% increase in exports, and 60% in value added. So that's an opportunity that's not, not to be missed. It would be remiss of this executive to, to miss it. So um, I look forward to it being tabled and discussed and agreed on the way forward over the next number of weeks at the executive. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Minister. When does the Minister hope to be in a position to put a formal paper to the executive? to make sure that the uncertainty regarding the Rural Development Programme is ended? I have a paper that's been drafted along with um, the dad, my daddy colleague, Arlene Foster, so I'm waiting for that to be cleared to go on to the Executive. I've written to Minister Foster to ask that that is the case, that we have it, the discussion at the Executive table, because as I said, it's so important that we don't lose momentum, that we build on what, the, um, what has been done, the strategic plan that's been set out by the industry, and we show the industry that this Executive is serious about helping the agri-food industry. I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, what conversation has she had with the European Commission and in, rela in relation to the court case on top slicing a single farm payments? Well, the Commission are, are obviously very aware of um, the situation here, that there wasn't an agreement in terms of the transfer. They were alert to the fact that I wanted to transfer 7%, and I think I've set the reasons out very clearly in this House around the need for a balanced approach to rural communities, that we need to look after our farming community, the, the environmental um, community, and also rural dwellers. That was why I wanted to transfer 7%. Unfortunately, because of the court challenge and the subsequent um, non-agreement of um, the DUP in terms of the 7% transfer, um, DEFRA obviously notified the European Commission, who have now led to a 0% transfer. But that being said, I still understand what I have to do. I'm still about creating a rural development programme that is fair and balanced and meets all the needs of all the um, rural communities. So um, I'll be committed to doing that. And alongside that, then, we also want to have the Agri-Food Strategy Report agreed so people can see that, um, that we're committed, this executive is committed to supporting the agri-food industry because the member will be aware that some of the key asks um, in the Agri-Food Strategy document, we would have been able to deliver those through the Rural Development Programme. So some people, in, for whatever reason, and they can account for themselves, um, decided to object to that. So I'll not be sidetracked. I'll continue to do what I need to do, um, regardless of the fact that we weren't able to have any transfer of funds. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer um, questions four and nine together. The business case for the relocation of the headquarters to Ballykelly is currently undergoing internal assurance. The preferred option points um, to a phased approach to construction with 400 workstations being completed in 2016 and a further phase of around 200 workstations being completed in 2020. My officials are continuing to progress this project with a major focus on the development of the HR strategies that are needed to ensure that the skills, experience and knowledge available within my department is retained and available when we move to the new headquarters. The success of um, relocation will obviously be measured against my department's ability to retain the high standard of service that our stakeholders and customers are used to, 
and the phased approach will allow my officials the time required to properly manage the move from a Belfast-based headquarters to one operating from the North West. And I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, could I ask the Minister, and I know that she has had a recent discussions with the DRD Minister, uh, what advances have been made in the provision of a rail halt uh, for the Ballykelly site or indeed a shuttle service, maybe from front of the other proposed sites at either Eglinton or Bellarina? Um, well, the member is aware that I, that I have recently met with Minister Donny Kenny to discuss the, the provision of a rail halt. I think it's a, it's, it's a good suggestion that's come forward, and I think it's something that we need to obviously scope out more and, and take a look at the options. There's, um, I think it's fair to say from the outset, there are a number of challenges uh, in, in taking it forward and providing a railway halt at Ballykelly. The turnaround times on the rail network, particularly in the North West, are very tight, so there's um, a lot, not a lot of room for manoeuvre there. However, we are exploring other options, such as a shuttle service, as you, as you suggested, maybe from Eglinton or from um, Ballerina. So there are some areas there that, that we still have to scope. But I think that um, whilst it might not be feasible at this moment in time for the railway halt, I, don't think that, um, uh, uh, I think we need to explore it further, because given the significance of, of the size of the site, the potential for other people to come forward and invest in the site, private business alongside um, our department and any others that, that tend to move on to the site, there may, in the future, may well be more of a need, even more of a need at that time. Well, Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her explanation thus far. Uh, could I ask the Minister what significance she places in the fact that when the strategic outline case was submitted towards the end of uh, 2011 to the Central Finance Group, no reference at all was made to the Ballykelly site? Well, I can assure the member that um, we've engaged with OFM DFM, who obviously own the site um, through the process. We're not running away with the idea on our own. That they're very aware and very alert to us, making sure that we move on to the site. We've identified the area that we want for, for the headquarters, and OFM DFM are supporting that. That's obviously a programme for government commitment also. I call Mr George Robinson. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, can the Minister confirm if the Department has any other plans to secure further areas of the shackled site for any other agricultural purposes? I can confirm not at this moment in time. At this moment in time, we are looking at the site for the, for the headquarters alone. Um, in the future, if other things can complement the headquarters, then I am quite open to looking at those things at that time, but at this moment in time, it is just the headquarters. Thank you. And I call Mr Colin Meeswood. Control with remote sensing has contributed significantly to help Endard make faster payments in 2013 in a scheme year when there were very significant changes to systems as a result of the introduction of a new mapping control. Had only traditional inspections in the field been used this year, the Department could not have envisaged paying, farmers, paying so many farmers so quickly. Resources have been dedicated to funding remote sensory cases for payment as a top priority from early February. This aim, or the aim is to have the majority of inspected claims paid by the end of February 2014 with the remainder paid by April 2014. This will mean that inspection cases generally, including remote sensory cases, will be processed much more quickly than inspection cases in previous years. Well, Mr Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Given the difficulties that we have seen and that farmers have seen with the drone-based system, is, there, is the Minister still confident that this is the best way uh, to do this? Yeah, I am, and I think even um, the figures speak for themselves, because if you look at um, where we're at now, this moment in time, 93.6 per cent paid, um, there are significant improvements on last year and the year before, so yes, I am confident that this, will, this is the way to go. Um, this year was particularly difficult because we had to line up the new remote control sensing with the payment system, with the mapping system, but now that we've got over that and we've done that, um, the priority is obviously to get everybody paid, and as I said, those payments actually will be issued. The start of those payments will actually be issued over the next number of days. So, yes, I think it is the way to go. It's going to allow us to be able to move to a system where we're able to make payments earlier than continue to make payments even earlier every year on year. So, that's something that I know that industry are, are wanting. Well, Mr. Sammy Wilson. I think that uh, those farmers who find themselves cash starved at the moment will be very angry at the dismissive way in which the Minister has said members should not lose a run of themselves over this issue, uh, and I think that that will be noted. Could you tell us at what stage was she aware that those farms surveyed in this way, would there be difficulties in making payments to them? 
Why were farmers not informed that there may be slowness in payments so that they wouldn't get into cash difficulties? And what's the, the, the very latest date that any farmer will be paid as a result of the delays which there are at present? My comments around people um, losing their own of themselves is primarily around the fact that you need to put it in context. And I've said from the start, from the very first question that I took in question time today, that anybody that's in that 6% of people that haven't been paid, I absolutely understand that they're anxious about their payment. I'm not dismissing that for one moment. But my aim is to try and get the majority of people paid as quickly as possible. I have improved things year on year, and I'll continue to do that. Remote control sensing is something that we must do if we're serious about trying to ramp up the number of inspections, get them done earlier, so get our payments earlier. My aim is to move to a point where we get the majority of people paid as early as possible. We are making improvements, so I, all I'm saying is put it in context. That's the point that I was making. But in terms of the delays, as I said, when it came to processing these, these um, claims, I've made sure that now there's enough resource, that there's extra resource in to make sure that those payments are made as quickly as possible um, to those remaining people that need to be paid. And as I've said, we have improved things. We've paid two months faster compared to last year, four months faster compared to the year before. We hope to have the majority of all claimants paid by April, which is a big significant improvement compared to years gone by. Sandra Overland. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And in fact, a number of farmers in Mid Ulster came to my office uh, to complain that they received no notification that they were undergoing this inspection. Uh, and so they weren't able to plan uh, for their financial situation. Um, and so they're very disappointed with that. Can the Minister uh, assure this House that she will personally check that those letters are delivered next year so that those farmers uh, can make plans for their financial situation? I think the member's suggestion that I'll personally go and hand deliver all the letters, but that being said, I want every, everybody who has been inspected needs to, or was supposed to get a letter. If they haven't got a letter, I don't know what that is about, but we can certainly look into it if you want to talk to me outside of question time about anybody individually. But all, all people that um, had an inspection by controlled remote sensing received a letter. A letter was posted to them on the address that DART holds for them. So if there's any discrepancies there, I'm happy to talk to you about it outside of question time. Commissioner Chris Little. Question number six. The Welfare of Animals is protected by the Welfare of Animals Act 2011, which recognises that causing an animal unnecessary suffering is a very serious offence. To reflect this, it significantly increased the penalties from those that were available under the previous Act. The Act provides powers for inspectors to take a range of enforcement actions appropriate to the circumstances of each case including giving advice, giving a warning, issuing a legally binding improvement notice or prosecution. The Act also sets out very clear enforcement rules. It gives my department responsibility for the enforcement in relation to farmed animals. The PSNI is responsibility for enforcement for, in respect of wild animals, animal fighting and welfare issues where other criminal activities are involved. And from the 2nd of April 2012, the Act gives councils responsibility for enforcement in respect of non-farmed animals such as domestic pets and horses. My department provides annual funding for councils to support that work. The involvement of councils has been a major step forward as it is the first time the North has had a dedicated manpower resource to investigate animal welfare complaints in respect of non-farmed animals and a budget to fund the work. Since April 2012, councils have investigated over 8,000 animal welfare complaints, carried out over 11,000 inspections and served over 360 improvement notices. They have also successfully prosecuted four animal welfare cases and I'm aware that there are a substantial number of other cases being prepared for prosecution. I believe the involvement of councils in this work is a very positive development and I'm encouraged by the valuable work that they have undertaken to date. And it's important that we allow sufficient time for the enforcement arrangements laid down in the Act to fully bed in before considering further changes. Well, Mr Little for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for the work that she's doing to tackle animal cruelty, but can I ask the Minister how effective uh, she believes the sentencing guidelines set by her department have been in deterring people from uh, partaking in such heinous crime? Well, obviously, sentencing within the legislative framework is a matter for the judiciary, and I've engaged with Minister Ford just to ensure that um, the sentencing is sufficient and, if you want, reflects um, the actions that have been taken um, forward, but in making sentencing decisions, this obviously comes down to the, to the judiciary and, and to the law. Um, following the introduction of the Act, as I said, I met with Minister Ford, and he um, has assured me that um, he has raised the issue with the Lord Chief Justice that in the um, 
and in his programme of action on sentencing, he has enhanced the structures by which the judiciary um, ensures consistent and appropriate setting, because I think it's important that there's consistency whenever all these cases are taken before the court. So I, I'm delighted that obviously that, that has now happened, that we have a, a, something in place that, that all judges can refer to when it comes to dealing with cases of animal cruelty, which in my opinion should be dealt with and, and, and uh, make sure there's proper deterrent to make sure they don't happen again. Call Ms. Bronwyn McGann. Uh, I thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask the Minister what funding do you provide to councils to assist with this matter, given the recent horse cruelty in my own constituency of Clougher Valley? Yes, um, my department is providing annual funding to, to help councils implement their new role of investigating complaints and carrying out enforcement actions, and including the fact that they have employed nine full-time animal welfare officers. I made 760,000 available for the 11-12 year, 780 for 12-13 and 800,000 for this financial year, so that figure will increase by um, 20,000 then for 2014-15. This funding also allows councils to assist um, animal welfare officers in carrying out their role by providing administrative support, bringing in specialist veterinary advice, paying for animal care costs and securing legal costs. Thank you. And that ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. William Erwin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister in relation to TB and the theft to cattle uh, from Bodgers? Can the Minister give the House an update on the TBR Bodger trials taking place in Northern Ireland? Yes, as the, as the members are aware, that they are ongoing. Um, I think it is a very novel approach that we have taken forward. We have in place um, uh, an EU-approved eradication programme, which is something that we are continuing to work through. In terms of the, the TBR, um, also alongside that, we also have our government industry partnership, which you'll be aware that I launched and came to committee and talked about um, before, or a number of months ago. I announced on the 17th September, actually, that I um, was going to establish the government industry strategic partnership that would look at um, TB. And that alongside the TVR um, approach, we have, as you know, identified the two areas, the two um, areas that we're looking at. The testing is ongoing. We have had a very high response from the farming community in those areas, which we're very pleased about. We had. In the second area, we had a bit of a problem with getting responses from farmers because they were actually just dealt with the snow issue at that time last year. So now that we move back into um, spring summer, we can start going out looking at the badger sets again. But I'm happy to provide the member with any more sort of detail that he wishes in writing if, if that's what he thinks would be helpful. Everyone for a supplementary. I thank the minister for a response. Does the minister agree with me that uh, the TB and badgers must be dealt with? If TB is to be eradicated in Kettle in Northern Ireland? Absolutely, and the members are aware that we're striving towards that. Um, and all these works that we're doing, the TVR approach, the government industry partnership, these are all things to try and get us to a stage where we can drive out TB. You're very aware that it's not a, there's no simple solution, there's no um, quick fix to the problem. Otherwise, we, we would take that avenue. But I think that if we look towards best practice in other areas and continue to take forward the research and the initiatives that we are, I think we're in a better place. And it is um, worth noting that the, the level that we're now has actually come down. We have a decrease in, in the, the level. I don't know the percentage off the top of my head, but we have had a decrease in, in the levels of, of, T, of TB. So that's something to be welcomed. I'm going to call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, would you agree with me that the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster is an integral part to rural Northern Ireland and that they play a vital role in developing many rural young people? And Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, declare an interest as a member and a past president. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yes, yes I, would. I would agree with, with, with the member around the role that they play. And I actually am going to be meeting them over the next number of weeks actually to discuss um, their plans for moving forward. I think that they've done significant work, particularly in terms of equality and a lot of campaigns that they've been working on. So I'm very happy to support them and, and look forward to meeting them and hearing about their plans for the future over the next number of weeks. Oh, Mr. Swan for a supplementary. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for you know, announcing to the House that she has planned to meet them because I know they are due at the end of their current fundings, funding period. And I wouldn't like to see her to fall into the same dilemma that her predecessor did when she tried to remove funding from the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster. I think that was a, a very bad mistake. And I would encourage the Minister to encourage the funding at the current level, if not at an ex extended level. I don't think it's fair to, to put that assertion on my predecessor. I think that um, the previous Minister worked with the Young Farmers Club to try and look at the areas of work that they're working on to try and tie in what they're doing in with um, what strategies we have within the department. So I think that's worked very successfully and that's been evident over the last number of years. And then I hope to be able to build on that whenever after I meet them. 
Going to call Mr. Alistair Macdonald. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister what the current level of EU infraction fines are, particularly in the past year? I don't have the, the figure with me, but if you're, in terms of disallowance, we're, we're somewhere around about 100 million in terms of the mapping. I um, think that's, that's to date from the start of the programme to date. Mr. Macdonald, for a supplement. Thank you. Well, what steps are we taking, or can we take, or might we take? to reduce these fines and restore our status in Brussels in terms of, of credibility? I think, uh, unfortunately, we're victims of how um, Brussels do their business um, in terms of how they carry out um, retrospective inspections of how we um, uh, take forward our mapping system. They've identified problems with our maps. We have taken significant steps to rectify those. We're communicating that to Brussels all the time, and the level of disallowance then keeps coming down year on year. So, I think we've got a positive engagement now with um, Brussels in terms of um, them being alert to the, how we're trying to tackle the problems they've identified with our maps. And the mapping system was a, a very major piece of work. We had 750,000 fields to remap. So that's all been done. We've made significant progress, and as I said, that's been communicated to Europe. I'm going to call Mr. Tom Elliott. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I would like to ask the Minister if she is aware that other areas of the European Union actually pay advanced payments to farmers and single farm payments, even uh, in some cases where there has been inspection carried out, and particularly remote sensing inspection. Would the Minister use the current CAP reform to bring about a similar policy in Northern Ireland? I have already said that it is my aim to move to a system where, in the first instance, we pay everybody as quickly as possible, but where we can make part payments. That would absolutely be my aim. I know that other areas across Europe do it. They have been far more, I suppose, progressed, advanced even in terms of remote sensing. We hope to be also get to that place very, very soon. And I think that given that we have cap reform, there is obviously now a significant opportunity for us to be able to do that. Supplementary. Okay, I thank the Minister for that. And, and on the issue as a follow up to cap reform, has she made any final decision on the issue around a single tier or two tier payment system for farmers? The member will be aware that the consultation has just closed and I'm looking at all the responses and then I'll take decisions on the way forward based on the round and all the responses that we received. And I'm delighted to have received so many um, representations, particularly on that, even on that one issue from over 400 farmers from your own constituency that actually have contacted me on their views in terms of um, regions and, and many systems we have. So I'll take decisions on the round based on all the consultation responses. Thank you. And I'll call Mr. Chris Little. Question five. Oh. <laughs> Apologies, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister? It's bound to happen at some point. Uh, can I ask the Minister to update the Assembly on the progress of Rivers Agency flood alleviation works in East Belfast? Well, the member will be aware that um, there is already work ongoing, and we actually are on target for. Um, we had set out that we would have the work completed by 2016. There were obviously delays at the start because we're working in conjunction with um, Belfast City Council, but. Um, quite a number of works have already been started, and we're very pleased with the progress. And as I say, we're on target for 2016, this early, very um, early part of 2016. A little for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for the works that are ongoing in East Belfast. And could I ask the Minister whether she has any plans to bid for extra funds to increase the rate and scale of flood alleviation for homes and businesses in East Belfast? Well, the member will, will be aware that um, the scheme that is about £6 million um, of investment it has something that has been worked up. Rivers Agency, with our technical expertise, have suggested this is the best way forward. This is the measures that are needed. So I am confident in their assessment on that. Um, like any area, um, whenever it comes to um, any additional resources that are needed, Rivers Agency will come and talk to me about um, the needs. But I think the £6 million investment is going to tackle a problem that has been long overdue and is something that obviously people of East Belfast have been waiting for. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Paul Gurdon. Minister, in relation to the current policy that is being implemented in relation to single farm payment and the exclusion of areas where tree uh, canopy of a tree uh, uh, is affecting how areas that should be excluded for payment. What uh, engagement has our department had to ensure that those areas are going to be included? That's an ongoing discussion, and we actually tried to communicate that message to farmers when the single farm, um, single farm payment application goes out. We actually send them out a guidance issue, so farmers themselves can take a look at what is 
um, eligible and what's not eligible. Those are discussions that are ongoing with Europe because I think some of the conversation I've had earlier just around um, disallowance, a lot of that has come about because of Europe's interpretation of what is deemed eligible and what is un ineligible. So um, we continue to have that conversation with Europe, but it's most important that we communicate the issue to farmers. Mr. Gervin, for supplement. Thank you. Thank the Minister for answer. Uh, as far as farmers are being concerned, uh, a number that are along the side of rivers have uh, taken the, adopt the approach of having a scorched earth policy. And as such, with the current policy, it looks like we're going to end up with uh, a total cleansing of all trees from certain areas. But this is having a negative impact upon uh, the river uh, life and also uh, those from the England fraternity. Is there any engagement with, the, with those involved in that end to see how we can move forward and ensure that we get a united approach towards res resolution on this matter? I mean, I agree with you. We do need to have a united approach because we want to look after the environment. We don't want to see land stripped of trees because we're trying to increase our planting, not the opposite. So um, it's important that, that everybody gets together, that everybody who's a partner in, in, in terms of that needs to have that discussion moving forward, and we're making sure that we do that. Call Mr. John McAllister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'll uh, draw members' attention to my interest as a recipient of single farm payment. Um, and, uh, and uh, really, in addition to, in your reply to Mr. Elliott's question, m the Minister gave us some of the details about the numbers of responses. Could you give us a more definitive uh, timescale of when she will have decisions made and when she has to have decisions made as to give clarity and certainty to farmers? As I said, the consultation has just closed on, I think it's the 17th of January. So we're looking at, we've had a significant number of responses and we're making our way through all of those. I want to make sure that the decisions I take are based on the fact that I have listened to those consultation responses, that I'm taking on board people's, um, the issues that they have identified or the ways forward that they have, um, think are correct. So um, my aim is to do that as quickly as possible because I know that any change is difficult for anybody to manage, but I know farmers are particularly anxious about um, cap reform and what it means for them. You may have seen that we have published on the DARD website and some of the farm papers actually covered it last week, a Q&A around. Um, cap reform and hopefully that gives some sort of clarity to farmers also. We're trying to make sure that we get as much clarity out there as quickly as possible but I can just assure the member that I intend to take decisions as, as quickly as I possibly can on the back of the consultation responses that I have received. Mr McAllister for supplementary. Thank you uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister accepts that in rural communities and in farmers and her constituency has in mind, this is uh, the big topic. It's a huge issue. It's going to set uh, the agenda and, and support for, for farming families for many years to come. So the quicker, and I would suggest the quicker that she can do that and respond to that, and would she agree with me, the quicker and the more engagement that she has, the better and the better decision, the better informed decision she will make. I agree with you and I can see for myself from the number of um, public meetings that were held, the engagement from the farming community, packed halls, no matter where you went. So that to me shows that people are wanting to know what's happening and I want to be able to give them the answers as quickly as possible. The consultation is closed um, just two weeks now but we're working our way through all the responses and I will take um, speedy decisions to be able to allow um, the farm community to be able to plan for their own personal affairs but also to allow the department to plan for the new systems that will come into place um, tw from 2015 on. Mr. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Prin Principal Levy Speaker. Can the Minister um, maybe give the House an update in terms of the working group that was set up to look at Loch Ness when a report will be made available for us to view? Yeah, I'm um, intending to bring a report to the Executive. I've actually had discussions with Carol Nicholson, the DECAL Minister, because obviously her department had taken forward a piece of work also, and I think it complemented the work that my department had done through with the working group. So the interdepartmental working group has been set, is being um, recalled again. They're um, taking a look at the two reports, and then we hope to bring out an executive paper very early in the spring. To, um, so we're talking about probably April time, March, April time, we bring a paper to executive. Mr. Clark, for supplementary. Uh, Minister, maybe uh, could you outline the house what the reason for the delay is? For it seems some uh, lengthy time since this group was initiated. And, uh, if you could update the house what the delay has been and why not? Why April, not now? Well, as I said, that, um, there were two pieces of work going, one within DECAL and one within my own department. Um, you can obviously imagine the scale of the work to scope the potential of Loch Ness because there is so much potential there. And also if you give the remit of all the different departments, that there's so many departments have an interest in, in DECAL and all their bodies. So I have um, now got the report from DECAL. We've just recently in December had a meeting, discussed the two reports, decided on a way forward. 
the Interdepartmental Working Group will bring that together and then put a paper which we will bring to the Executive very shortly. Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, President, Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister. Minister, what actions are you taking in respect of rural isolation, uh, particularly with regards to uh, people in my constituency in the glens of Antrim and other rural isolated areas? I'm, I'm very committed to that area, and if you'll be aware of my um, attack on poverty and social isolation framework, which basically took a, is a re whole range of measures um, about access to benefits, about people, rural enablers going door to door to households. We're talking about um, youth employment schemes. There's quite a range of issues, which I'm very happy to, the member can actually pick them up off the website, but it's a serious effort at trying to tackle isolation, which obviously exists in rural communities, and quite often people in rural communities feel like a poor relation when it comes to services. So it's a pot of £16 million, but it's, I would call it leverage funding. It, funds, it draws in um, areas of working cooperation from other departments to do projects, particularly maybe around rural transport, things like that that maybe wouldn't have happened had we not have had this pot of money and this plan in place. So I'm very committed to making sure that that piece of work continues. And as I said, there's quite a range of areas of work that, that we're actually taking forward. That uh, time is up, and we will now.